Um, I'm now just going to read a couple of um, verses from Isaiah. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. For I hold you by your right hand, I, the Lord your God, and I say to you, don't be afraid, I am here to help you. Though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid. People of Israel, for I will help you. And I find this very comforting to read. There are so many promises from the Lord, despite everything that has happened and is still happening. He says, I've called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, You are my servant, for I've chosen you and will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. For I hold you by your right hand, I, the Lord your God. I say to you, don't be afraid, I am here to help you. Though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid, people of Israel, for I will help you. Um, I am your, the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the only one, the only Holy One of Israel. And although I wonder about Jacob being called a lowly worm, which did stand out to me, I looked it up and it said, this meant that although he is or they are lowly, the worm being a symbol of insignificance and can be trodden underfoot, the Lord God Almighty is on their side. He will look after the poor and needy. He will give them fountains, pools, rivers and planting trees in the barren desert and good things, even though he is not really happy with what's going on. A bit like today's world, I'm sure. It's comforting to know that nothing changes with the Lord. He loves and cares for us and still wants to give us good things if we come to him repenting and offering ourselves completely and hiding nothing from him. Now, um, Sam is going to speak to us in a moment on being ready for new believers. But before that, um, Catherine is going to read the reading that Sam has chosen from Acts. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate within them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phasenia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they had reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice amongst you that the Gentiles should hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between them and us, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, 
We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done amongst the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intended to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild. I will restore it. The rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, in the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For all the laws of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest of times and is read in the synagogue on every Sabbath. Amen. Thank you, Sue, um, for your prayers. And th thank you uh, for allowing me to be here this morning. It's a real privilege. I'm Sam. I'm director of CYO. Uh, I'm married to Naomi, and we've got two wonderful children. We've got Evie, who's five, uh, going on 15. And um, we've got Ezra, who's five months, and has just started teething. Praise the Lord for teething. Um, we're very grateful for a good night's sleep last night, which uh, was long coming. <coughs> so CYO is... Uh, oh, I was getting there, but thanks, Claire. <laughs> no, no, so it's, it's helpful for the prompt. Uh, so C CYO stands for Christian Youth Outreach and is a charity that's been running for about 30 years in Colchester. It has done almost every iteration of school Christian schools work possible. Uh, and what we currently do is we do chaplaincy. Because um, if you move on to the, to the next slide. So our, our vision really is that every school in Colchester would be supported um, in the spiritual development and pastoral care of students through regular, consistent, intentional Christian presence. Um, that, that's what we want to see. So that's something like 66 schools. Um, so we've got a fair way to go, as you'll see at the end, as, as we begin to share kind of where we are and, and where we're hoping to go. Um, but that, that's our vision. And I wonder what that would do to the landscape of Colchester and the surrounding villages if there was an intentional Christian presence in every school opportunity for children to ask their big questions, hear the good news of Jesus, live through the Bible stories, explore for themselves, have someone to turn to when life is tough and difficult. And I want to find out what would happen if we managed to, to make that happen. So we love chaplaincy. If you go to the next slide, please, Cos. So we love, we love chaplaincy. That's our model at the moment of schools ministry. There are loads of ways in which you can engage with a local school. Chaplaincy is what we do at CYO because we, we believe in habits three spaces really well. If you move on to the next one. A chaplain really does three things within a school, and each of them we believe we see in the life of Jesus. So um, starting with the darkest blue, mentoring and pastoral support. Jesus was always available to listen, to listen to people. Uh, and I think there's, there's something really powerful about listening to people. Um, it might have been a famous artist who said uh, that listening is so close to being loved that most people can't tell the difference. When you really listen to and feel that connection. Uh, so that's what we do with mentoring. Provide space for students who are going through a difficult time, need some extra support. Uh, and we listen to them and we offer uh, some advice. Spiritual development. We see that, don't we, in the life of Jesus. Just wanting to share the things of the kingdom with his people. And so we want to make the most of the opportunities there are within school 
to share the good news of Jesus through RE, through assemblies, through prayer spaces, through lunch clubs and big question things and playground pastors. And you come up with a name for it and we've probably done it at some point. Uh, and then lastly, being available. It's really easy, at least I've found in working in a school, to just be tied up with you're doing this at this time, then you're doing this, and then you're over there. But there's something about the model of Jesus's ministry where he was interruptible that I love, and it's something that God's been challenging me on since we moved to Colchester about two years ago, is can I live life in a similar way to Jesus where he was going to help Jairus's daughter, it comes to a complete standstill to heal the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. And everyone else around must have been going crazy. Jesus, you're missing the point. Jairus' daughter, but he knows he can do both. And he was available. He was interruptible. And that's kind of our model for chaplaincy within school. To be around for those moments that seem inconsequential, but you walk down the right corridor at the right time to bump into that teacher who's having a rough day. Or you're free to just sit in the staff room or be in the playground. Uh, and so really, the activities for us that fall into chaplaincy are so broad. Uh, but it means that almost anyone could be a chaplain. If you can sit and listen, um, if you can help run something that helps students think about faith, life, the big picture, and if you can learn to be interruptible, you can be a chaplain. So that pretty much qualifies all of us. Um, but we've made an intentional shift to CYO to do this in partnership. Um, I, I heard something that broke my heart when I, when I came to, to CYO. So I came in as director in May 2023. And someone said to me, oh, I love CYO. Our motto here is let go, let CYO. And I died. I just died inside. I was like, no, it is not on CYO that the Lord will build his church. Not at all. It's the church that is the hope of the nation, the local church. And so we've made a deliberate move as CYO to partner with churches and to take a back seat. We still do all of our schools work that we're doing. But in order to get into all 60-something schools, I don't want to say it wrong because I know it's on a recorded, 60-plus um, schools, we have to do this together. And we have to do this in partnership with local churches, with the people of God. And so we are changing strategy and or have been since I came into post last May and we're working to equip empower and enable local churches through partnership and to help the local church work much more closely in their school now the reason that we do that is because theologically we think it makes sense that it's the church that is God's plan a and only plan for the salvation of the world um, not an independent charity um, but also because it makes it so much easier for students who start to get interested in faith to go and take those next steps and continue to explore. If they already know people who live locally to them, they see their faces and it's the same face at a church run, youth event, kids club, you name it, whatever. It's so much easier for children to bridge that gap um, if they know that it's the same people and they have that relationship. So that's why we do it in partnership, because if you can go to the next one. Um, so our partnership strategy really is to resource and to offer uh, resourcing, encouragement, support, um, but also to open up to a wider network. So we have lots of people who are working in partnership with us who are our volunteers currently and staff, and we do a networking thing for encouragement and support. Um, sometimes you have fantastic days in school, um, sometimes they're less fantastic. Uh, so it's good to be able to join with others, to pray and to support one another. And finally, our, our partnership is mission partnership. For those churches that really are similarly aligned to us, have a similar heart and vision, we want to pour all of our energy and efforts into those churches and help them build up a schools work strategy and youth work strategy. Because if we move on again, sorry, I'm doing it every time you go back to the camera. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, and so, so that's, our, that's our mission partner uh, approach. And we'd love to just support any church that's really serious about working in their local school, but not just in their local school, because we want to see more than that. We want to then see brid natural br bridges and pathways built for children to come to church to find and flourish in faith. So if you go to the next one, 
Um, <coughs> so this is where, where we're at at the moment. We've got six chaplains in secondary schools. We've got a chaplaincy team happening in a primary school. Uh, so you can see we've got a long way to go to hit 60 plus churches, but God is with us and we can do it. Uh, we have two active mission partners at the moment, so two churches who have really decided, yes, we want to build a school's work strategy and we want to work together. And so we're pouring a lot of time and effort into, into those churches at the moment. And we've got five that are kind of on the cusp, that are discerning, praying, weighing, and, and seeking out the way ahead. So we're really, really excited. There seems to be movement um, in the right direction. And, uh, and there's some incredible stats on the screen that you, you can see from last year. And the one that's the most difficult is the countless thousands of conversations that our chaplains have that to the chaplain are very inconsequential. But they just showed some kindness. They remembered a student's name. They remembered that that staff member had an issue with their daughter's leg last weekend. And those things spoke volumes to people. And those are the things that are really hard to capture. But those are the things that are happening in school um, every day uh, across the week. Uh, and so I'm chaplain at um, Colchester Academy, and I'll be there tomorrow. And the last few weeks, it's been a real privilege to be, to be in the school and to be supporting students, and particularly have an opportunity to, to share with students who have been affected um, by the bereavement um, from the hit and run with Taylor that s some of you will have heard about. And it's been a real privilege to just sit and to hear about Halen and to support students in that. Uh, uh, and it's really interesting the role we see of a chaplain coming into the school and people who don't have a faith at all. I've had staff members come running up to me and say, I know you're the chaplain, there's someone you need to see. But I don't believe in what you do. But there's someone you need to see because I think it will work. <laughs> You're like, okay. <laughs> so we go from there. So it's a, it's a real privilege. It's a real, real privilege. So thank you for your prayers and your support. I know that the church here are supporters. Um, so really, really thankful for that. And I suppose this, this morning's um, message stems from what we're seeing in schools. We're seeing students gather together at lunchtime. We've got a group in one secondary school. 20 boys gather to pray and to read scripture, most of whom not, are Christ not Christians, not from Christian households, but they've just decided we're interested in this ancient book. Come on, come on. At another school, we've got a, a, couple, of, a couple of girls that, that are part of a church, but have decided that they want to meet with our chaplain regularly at break time to pray for their school. I mean, they're giving up their break time. That, that stuff is gold in school. And they're giving it up to come and to pray um, for their school. We're seeing when we run prayer spaces, students just open up and express things that they've never been able to express before. And we're hearing stories of, of students just saying things like, in this space, I felt connected to something. And we obviously know who they're feeling connected to. They don't have the language that for that yet. But there seems to be this openness and this, and this move. Um, and so I suppose the, the, the question for us is, are we ready? Are we ready for if revival happens right now and loads of kids, children, young people, families start turning their hearts towards the Lord? Are we ready? We might need to build an extension here. And, you know, there's some other practical things, but, but, but are we ready for when they come? And I think it's important to look back at church history and see that time and time again, the church hasn't been ready for revival. And there are some consistent pitfalls that we see as far back as Acts 15. And so we're just going to look at some of those, some of those today. So the, the first pitfall, I suppose, is, um, is I've called it endearingly the legalism trap. Now, the legalism trap is is essentially, you're not doing it right. You've got to do this, X, Y, Z, fill in the blank, in order for your faith to be valid. Now, the Pharisees always get a bad rap, and I'll agree with you, but the moment we turn to Acts, these Pharisees are not the Pharisees that killed Jesus, put him on the cross. These are Pharisees that are now followers of Jesus. So that's worth bearing in mind. They love the Lord and they want and they recognize Jesus is our savior. But they still fall into this. You have to be circumcised in order to be saved. 
Now, the leaders in Jerusalem, they, they handle this quite well, and we're going to discover that as we go through this morning. They handle it quite well, but the leaders in Jerusalem could have just said, yep, that's just what it means now. To be a follower of Jesus, that's what it is. These are the rules, the regulations, the stipulations, the expectations, and any other Asians I can think of. These are the things that are required to make you a valid follower. But they didn't do that. They didn't fall for the legalism trap. But three quick examples from church history where we have fallen for the legalism trap, where time and time again, God has done something new amongst his, amongst his people. People's hearts have been turned into the Lord and we've not been ready because we've fallen for the legalism trap. You're not doing it right. You have to do X. So firstly, thinking of the Wesleyan revival, John Wesley riding, what was it, 9,000 miles a year on horseback. <sighs> Gosh, that's a lot. I wouldn't drive 9,000 miles a year. <laughs> um, but he, out there preaching, is kicked out of so many churches, not welcome because of this new radical way of thinking. And lots of people who were being converted who weren't part of mainstream church at the time have nowhere to go. They're being thrown out of churches as well. They're not welcome for this new radical way of being Christian and this kind of heart and desire for travel and for evangelism. That's really sad. They weren't welcome. And we know through church history that when Wesley dies, the Methodist church becomes its own denomination and they become very insular. That passion for travel and evangelism dies with John Wesley, and they become insular. How sad is that? The people weren't ready. Think of the Azusa Street, sorry, excuse me, lots of Zs and Ss in that one, Azusa Street revival, the Pentecostal revival. Lots of people suddenly out of nowhere from prayer meetings turning to the Lord, and the Holy Spirit is poured out, and people are speaking in tongues. And so they weren't welcomed in mainstream church because mainstream church at the time didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, didn't believe in speaking in tongues. And so, again, all of these people coming who need to be welcomed into the family, into the fold as brothers and sisters in Christ, need to be discipled. You're not welcome here. You're doing it wrong. You need to do X, Y, Z for your faith to be valid. Thankfully, the Pentecostal revival didn't remain insular But how sad is it that they had to set up a new denomination? The Jesus movement, you might have come across the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s. There was a real revival amongst those who were living the hippie, free love lifestyle. And once again, the church wasn't ready. Uh, These these people living the, the hippie lifestyle who have got saved, turn up to church. The male's hair is long unacceptable. They smell. They're, and it's quoted, actually, in, in a book. Their Bibles were too dog-eared and annotated, which was deemed inappropriate and unchristian. <laughs> we would praise anyone now to turn up with a dog-eared Bible and say, good for you, you're getting into the Bible. And it almost feels laughable now, but there's, there's something of that Pharisee in all of us, isn't there? There's something of that legalism in all of us. So if we're going to be ready for what the Lord's going to do, we've got to ask the Lord to just examine our hearts. God, where do I fall into this legalist trap? Some of this stuff seems laughable. They didn't come in their Sunday best. They smell, you know, we think, yeah, we're past that. But what are some of the things that we think that we hold on to? The expectations that we put on other people to help us think that their faith is valid. Here's a couple of examples. So when I got saved at 14, there was a, there was a real thing at the church that I was at. You, uh, you have to read your Bible first thing in the morning. Because to be a Christian, you have to give your f- the first fruit of the day to the Lord. I mean, I was a teenager. That is not happening, is it? Uh, did it make me less of a Christian? I'm not so sure. I read it at night when I was uh, amped and wired and <laughs> was awake because that's just how I'm wired. Um, but is it some of those things, just to prompt your thinking for this morning, is it about how and when you read the Bible or whether you can listen to the Bible? Shock horror. 
that can, that can be really challenging for people. Um, how and when you pray and where you pray and what you must or mustn't say when you pray. Some people pray the Trinity police, don't they? I don't know if you've ever come across someone who plays this game. Um, sorry, we pray to the Father uh, through Jesus. Just, uh, you know, I can't even do it right because I don't know it. But they play this game. Oh, no, we, you don't pray to the Spirit. You said the Holy Spirit. You ever come across one of those? Good. Steer clear of them. And if you do, help them come off the legalism track. Is it certain foods that you should or shouldn't eat? Certain types of music you should and shouldn't listen to? Is it types of social media or apps that you should or shouldn't have on your phone in order to be a valid Christian? Now, some of these things are personal convictions. The Lord's spoken to me quite clearly about what music I shouldn't listen to when I drive because it makes me drive that little bit faster and just be that little bit tetchier with other drivers. Is that a rule for everyone everywhere? Probably not. But that's probably something that the Lord has put on my heart. And those are the things we can very quickly fall into. Something that, that we feel is a personal conviction for us, that we place that expectation on someone else too. That is the legalism trap. We'd do well to avoid it if we could. So we see in Acts 15 that the Pharisees have fallen into the legalism trap. But that's okay. We all do. In fact, I tend to fall into that one quite often about what people should and shouldn't be doing for their faith to be valid. It's how we handle it and how we move forward that's important. Now the problem, the other pitfall, is that we go the other way. So we can fall too much into, there's too many rules, too many stipulations, or we can fall the other way. And this is the liberalism trap. The believers could have chucked the baby out with the bathwater. Wow, the Gentiles, they're coming to follow Jesus. This has never happened before. Let's make it as easy as possible. It's all grace. It's all love and forgiveness. Do whatever you want. There's no expectation for change. There's no rules for living. Just go for it. Jesus wins at the end, so it'll all be fine. God's doing a new thing. We need to get with the times. We just need to adapt and lower the bar. That's the liberalism trap. Grace with no expectation of change. Grace with no expectation of holiness. And the liberalism trap actually is quite hard to spot. It's quite hard because our faith genuinely is all about grace. For we are saved by grace, not through works, so that none may boast. But it doesn't stop there, does it? There's countless citations in the New Testament where we're called to work out our salvation through fear and trembling, where we're to be changed from one degree of glory to another, where we're called to be holy, a royal priesthood, set apart, living to the beat of a different drum. And so we can't stay in this place. And, it, you know, it's scary to think that that's the other trap, is that when all these new believers come, that the bar's so low that there's no claim on what we would and wouldn't do with our life or what we would or wouldn't think or believe, that we just look like everybody else anyway. But we come here on Sunday. Wouldn't that be tragic? Wouldn't that be a missed opportunity? And sadly, we're seeing the liberalism trap all over, just like the legalism trap. You know, a, uh, a prominent leader in a certain denomination, which I won't name, but you probably will know, has recently said that all paths lead to the Lord, which was quite shocking for that denomination of church. Um, and all different religions are just the same, a different language talking to the same God, which we know is not true, because the Bible says time and time again, there is one true God, and the only way to him is through Jesus. So we know that that can't be true, but this is the liberalism trap. We just fall into where there's grace, there's love and forgiveness, and, and it'll all be all right for everyone on the night. So some questions on the liberalism trap, if that's your, your trap that you fall into. I've got my notes all mixed up, by the way. Excuse me for a moment. <coughs> some questions 
Firstly, I think it's helpful to, to ask yourself, where do I tend to fall? Do I tend to fall into rules, or do I tend to fall into no expectation for change? Now, I tend to fall into rules. That's, that's where I tend to fall. You might tend to fall a different way to me, and that's okay. This is why we need each other. This is why we're the body of Christ. And it's helpful to know where you fall so someone can hold you accountable. Um, not so that you can go, you're doing it again, Sam. Stop with all the rules. But actually just, Sam, is that, your, is that your inner Pharisee talking? And I find that so helpful when my wife and I have those conversations, which you bet we do. But some questions. Are there any beliefs about the Christian faith that I just need to look at with fresh eyes? Are there any things that I've written off that God wouldn't say that, or that was 2,000 years ago, or the times have changed, that I just need to come back to and just look at again with fresh eyes. And I, f- I find for me, when falling for the liberalism trap, this verse really, really helpful from 1 Corinthians 10, 23. We're allowed to do all things, but not all things are good for us to do. We're allowed to do all things, but not all things help others grow stronger. Now, the leaders in Jerusalem recognize absolutely that salvation is all by grace, but they also land on some rules for living. So there is a middle ground here. It isn't all grace with with no expectation of change. There isn't rules upon rules upon rules and expectation, but there are some stipulations that the Lord has on our life for what we should be doing with our lives. And they land on, in verse 20, to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat of strangled animals, and from blood. And we can argue that till the cows come home. But that's what Scripture says, so we'll go with it. So here are are the two traps that we might fall into. Liberalism, too many rules. Legalism, legalism, too many rules. I got those wrong way around. And liberalism. Grace with no expectation of changing. And the last one is the handling of disagreement badly. Time and time again, as we've seen, there's disagreements within the church split. A new denomination is formed, or a new church plant, or a new expression, or the home church movement, or, 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 or. And what's fascinating about Acts 15 is that this is a brilliant blueprint for handling disagreement Christianly. Handling it well and how we should handle disagreement. So really, really, really quickly. They have a sharp disagreement and they don't split the church. They don't say, right, you become the Pharisaic Christians where you have to be circumcised and will be the non-Pharisaic Christians. They don't do that. In fact, they don't decide at all. They travel to Jerusalem to meet with the church leaders. And I think that's really important because... On the travel, it would have taken them a long time. And on the travel, you bet that they were talking. They were discussing about what it, what it should and shouldn't be. They were having that conversation, open dialogue. That's really important. And that it took time. They also went to people who were kind of further along in their faith than they were. And I think that's really important too. They discussed with the church leaders. So what should it be? What shouldn't it be? They prayed They waited on the Lord. Later on in Acts 15, when they write the letter back, they say, it felt good to us and to the Holy Spirit that we should land on these things that you abstained from, Um, all of those things that I'd listed. So they wait, they pray, they talk, they seek wise counsel, and they do end up making a decision that's somewhere in the middle. Not too many rules, and not grace with no expectation of change. And I think this is a great blueprint for us because it's really easy, isn't it, to just go, I disagree with that. That's not for me. God would never say that. Anyone ever done that one before? That's not in my Bible. Uh, and it's really easy for us to, to write that off. Well, it's always been done that way. Well, no, when I was young, we had to do that, so that's how you be a Christian. It's really easy to fall either way on those things. But instead, if, if we're to be ready for what God's doing at this time, if we're to be ready, we need to be working on our hearts now. God, help me stay right in the middle to keep the things that are important, important, and the things that are just fluff, to keep them as just fluff. That might be a personal conviction for me. 
I'm just going to keep it to the side. But we will do well if we follow the model in Acts 15. If we talk together, keep the conversation open. If we pray, if we wait, and if we look at Scripture, that's the other key thing from Acts 15, is that someone stands up and says, look, it's here, it's written of old. The Gentiles will come to know the Lord. This is a good thing. And so I suppose my my prayer for us is that we'll go and that we'll reflect and that we'll do the work on our hearts and our minds individually and maybe even as a church to really be ready so we know it doesn't matter when people come in, what they dress like, what they look like, smell like, what background they're from. It doesn't matter. We're going to welcome them. But we know how we're going to disciple them. We know what is important and what's just fluff. And that's really the message for today. Can we just pray?